IQ and wisdom are totally different. And my argument has been that having an IQ that's very high can actually gravitate against wisdom. Uh, and the reason is that people who are smart think that wisdom automatically comes with it. So when they act foolishly, they don't see it in themselves because they think they're uh, invulnerable to foolishness. But we see a lot of foolishness in high IQ people. And I'm not accepting myself either. I mean, we, it's something we all have to fight in ourselves. So there's been this ongoing debate about what IQ is and what intelligence is. IQ, as we know, is this reliable measure that you can make, but it's not so clear that IQ amounts to intelligence. Um, psychological intelligence probably requires a broader view of things. To help us do this, Robert Sternberg is a professor of psychology at Cornell University and one of the giants of the space. He has been at the forefront of intelligence research for quite a while now, and he is one of the most cited and well-respected psychologists around. Uh, here, we talk about his theory of intelligence, creativity, wisdom, love, and hate. Here is my conversation with Robert Sternberg. So, so just to start off, uh, a lot of our folk intuitions about intelligence seem to be in the way of intelligence as some innate property, like uh, it's some th some fixed genetic endowment that we have. Uh, how does your work on intelligence move us past that to a more broader conception? Almost everything in human behavior has some innate component. And I think that we've moved past the 20th century argument, is it genetic or is it environmental or what percent is genetic and what percent is environmental. Uh, since we have learned about epigenetics, the whole question of percentages, genetic and percentages environmental has seemed much less meaningful. Uh, if you look at the components of intelligence and how they manifest themselves in life, uh, what I have argued is that at least some of them pretty much have to be at least environmentally influenced. For example, creativity, I have argued, so I, I view intelligence, I should say, as having four components, an analytical part, which is more like IQ, a creative part, a practical part, and a wisdom-based part. So you need the creative part to come up with ideas. You need the analytical part to know if they're good ideas. You need the practical part to implement the ideas and to persuade others of their value. And you need the wisdom part to make sure that the ideas help to achieve some kind of common good beyond just yourself. So if you look at the parts one by one, like the creative part, creativity is largely an attitude. It's uh, creativity is defined by uh, scholars in the field of creativity as coming up with ideas that are novel and useful. And what's novel it can't be genetic. I mean, it's determined by what environment you're in. When do you live? Where do you live? What's novel in one place isn't novel in another place. And what's considered useful in one place may be considered useless in another and may be considered heretical or treasonous in a third. So all of that stuff of what's novel and useful depends on the fit between a person what they're doing, the task, and the con context they're in. So if you're talking about the creative part of intelligence as some kind of person by task, by environment or context interaction, even if part of it is genetic, certainly parts of it have to be driven by stuff you've acquired as to what is novel in your environment and what's valued, what's considered useful. If you look at the practical part, or what we sometimes call common sense, 
well, you're not born with common sense. You don't know anything. I mean, you don't know, uh, for example, when you're born that I shouldn't start screaming square words right now. <laughs> you know, that's not something you're born with. Common sense is something you develop. Uh, some people develop, others less so. And so that too is an interaction between the person and the kinds of tests they do in the environment. I emphasize that because what's commonsensical in one place isn't in another. Like screaming may be okay in a soccer match, but probably not in a podcast. So you learn what kinds of behavior are appropriate in what kinds of tasks and in what kinds of environmental contexts. Um, you know, being clever is usually good, but being too clever on your taxes uh, can land you in jail. So this is stuff you learn from life. That's not something you're born with. Some people learn it and some don't. Uh, some keep making the same mistakes over and over and over again. Um, okay. Just this morning, one of the candidates for the 2024 election asked for help from Vladimir Putin. So that doesn't strike me as a good person by task by context interaction, given current relations with Russia. Um, so it's something you learn, but some people don't learn it. Uh, and the third, the next component is wisdom. And wisdom is certainly not something you're born with. Wisdom is how do you use your abilities, your personality, your knowledge to help to achieve a common good, to do something that helps the world. Well, no one's born knowing how to help the world or with a predisposition on going to help the world. That's something you develop. Some people develop it. Some only look out for themselves and become politicians pretending to look out for others. So the three components I mentioned, the creative, the practical, and the wisdom-based, it's, it's definitionally impossible for them to be just genetic stuff. Now, the analytical seems to have more of a genetic component, but that's when you talk about intelligence, the analytical part of intelligence applied in sort of academic decontextualized ways. When you talk about intelligence applied to the world, that's again not something you're born with. And some people use their genetic skills or talents, whatever they brought into the world, to uh, apply their analytical skills and attitudes to the world, and others don't. Um, and some people, uh, to me, then, an awful lot of intelligence is about not the abilities you come in with, but how you deploy them, how you use them. Uh, I just had a paper published within the last couple of weeks uh, called Intelligent Attitudes. It's in the Journal of Intelligence. And an awful lot of this is just deciding to use your intelligence I mean, take conspiracy theories. I mean, Elon Musk, who must be at least somewhat smart. I mean, he's so I mean, I, I don't know what his IQ is. I mean, he's promoting conspiracy theories on Twitter. So he's got the intelligence. But when you've got lots of people, you know, Bannon, I mean, you know, these guys are smart in an IQ sense, but when they start saying things online uh, that are uh, just sort of out and out conspiracy theories. The problem isn't that they don't have the IQ points. It's that the IQ points are sort of, they're latent, they're uh, unused. And so a lot of intelligence is just, you know, I can, I can think about this problem and do better than believing uh, 
that all the problems in the world are caused by George Soros or hidden bankers or whatever. So our biggest problem in the world is not about any genetic component of intelligence. It's about people who have that genetic component, but for one reason or another, um, it's, it's not being used. Right. So many of the institutions that lead to people being in positions of power don't have that broad view of intelligence. They have a very narrow view of intelligence, and it's not working. If you just look at the problems that we're facing today, um, there's lots of probably narrowly smart people that aren't working out. You're not kidding. Uh, that's that's what that's sort of the topic of my book from last year, my 2021 book, uh, Adaptive Intelligence. That. What difference does your score on an IQ test or an ACT or an SAT or a statewide test make uh, if you're contributing to pollution or global climate change or people dying from COVID or cigarette smoke or whatever? Uh, we we have the wrong conception of intelligence. The, the trouble is that once you, all societies are stratified in some way, in whatever way they're stratified, in some countries it's by religion. You know, if you're not Muslim or Jewish or Christian or something, you're a lower Buddhist or you're a lower class or caste. In some cases, it's by wealth. I mean, wealth in our country, the United States buys you a heck of a lot. Uh, there, you know, we've had, say, these, uh, very rich people with dumb kids uh, in the sense of, you know, they're kind of screw ups in everyday life, but money can buy them an awful lot until, until the court proceedings come along. Um, if, if sometimes it's by gender, you know, in some countries, if you're a woman, you, you can't even go out of the house by yourself. Uh, so that, does it that you're throwing away half the talent of the population? Uh, so in in our country we have this sort of phony stratification by academic talent. I say phony because it's very highly correlated with how wealthy your parents are. Uh, so academic talent is kind of a way of laundering parental resources. Parents with a lot of money can't guarantee the kids more uh, <coughs> academic resources, but they can buy the private school to get the kid on a polo team. And how many kids from uh, from poor families are going to get into an Ivy League school because they played pol polo or uh, golf uh, or water polo or whatever it is? I mean, you know, there are just so many ways that wealth matters here. But the point is that no matter how you do it, whether it's by gender or uh, wealth or IQ or something else, the people get into power want to keep the power and they want their kids to have it. And so any system you create creates a set of casts. In India, it's explicit, but in other countries, maybe more implicit. And then the people at the top do everything they can to ensure that they stay where they are and that their kids will enjoy the same benefits. So you can always find reasons to keep any system you have. Um, and people do. I just also published an article uh, in Roper Review uh, also a few weeks ago on how <laughs> correlational studies that show, for example, how IQ predicts later success in life you know, they're, they're useful, but you have to remember that people who do better on these tests are showered with advantages that people who don't do well on the test never get. And the people who do well on the test tend to be, on average, people who come from families with more resources. So essentially, it's like if you give some people opportunities and you don't give others opportunities and then you test them 20 years later it's not surprising that the people you gave opportunities to will do better than the people you didn't give opportunities to and then 
the sort of IQ testing establishment, which itself was created by people who do well on these tests, and so mostly want to keep their positions to make sure their kids keep their positions. Say, hey, look, you know, this is a predictor. Yeah, it is. It's a predictor, but it's a contaminated predictor because our societal favoring of those kids facilitates their getting into positions where they can do better 20 years later. And then you go, oh, look, the IQ tests work. What they showed is that the society supports the people it supports. In, in countries that decide by wealth, it supports wealthy people. In countries decide by religion, for some people, the people of the state approved religion do better. If it's by gender, then the men do better. If you I used to be president of the American Psychological Association. If you go into the top floor conference room, they have portraits of the APA presidents. And for years, it was almost all men. Well, what does that show? Women weren't eligible. So it would look like, well, you know, male gender uh, predicts success in getting elected. Yeah, because you created a system to benefit certain people, all systems do that. Royalty does it too. You know, if you're a royal birth, you could be a total screw up. Uh, you still get to be king unless you're assassinated or deposed. And it's self perpetuating, right? Like it's not just a one off in higher education. Oh, it goes on and on and on. You know, like look at the look at the siblings and the children of some of the top CEOs or U.S. presidents. I mean, like, holy crap. But they'll do well because even if they don't go to college, they'll do fine. But if their parents, you know, many times their parents buy the kids' ways into college, essentially with large donations. Uh, that was the case uh, with a recent... Uh, uh, anyway, it doesn't matter. Uh, that's That's just the way the system works. Since you mentioned testing, um, how bad is the the bias in testing, um, cultural or otherwise? I don't know what to call it. It depends on how you measure bias, right. how badly the tests are biased. If you measure it the way psychometric, the psychometric system is designed to be self-perpetuating. It's really admirable as a self-perpetuating system. So it shows that the tests predict future outcomes because society gives advantages to those who do better. And it says there's no bias or a little bias because the criteria have the same bias that the predictors do. So in a psychometric sense, the prediction is not biased one group against the others because if you say you have a minority group that you know, grows up in an environment that doesn't support the development of test-like skills, then they have fewer opportunities to advance. Sometimes they're kept out of better level jobs. And so it looks like the tests are unbiased because, hey, look, they didn't get into the jobs. And if they did, they didn't do as well because they never had the same opportunities in education. So we create self-perpetuating systems and then claim its nature at work. Uh, but, you know, as I say, it, that that's not just about IQ. That's about all systems that people who are privileged, whether it's uh, people who create IQ tests or do thousands of studies showing over and over and over again the tests. Pretty, I mean, like, can you imagine there, you know, there are psychologists whose whole career is like, hey, look, the test predicted. Uh, here's study 8,600. Hey, look, the test predictor, you study 10,865. Look, the I mean, they're people who that's what they do for a career, and we know they predict. So, you know, we could have stopped that 50 years ago. They do predict. The question is not whether they predict, it's why. Right. You're not saying that there's, there's no such thing as G, that there isn't something predictable there. It's just that when we're talking about intent, intelligence conceptually, it, it pays to take a broader conception of what intelligence means playing out in the world. There is a psychometric factor of G. I, that, I think that argument has been a waste of time. Uh, maybe it was worth it in you know 1970 or something, but psychometrically you get a general factor. Uh, 
some people call it general mental ability, a GMA, or whatever you want to call it. The question is, why do you get it and what does it mean? And my argument is not whether it exists, it's how general is it? And what what does it mean? And I think that what we we have a lot of uh representatives in Congress and the Senate and in the House of Representatives who went to very prestigious colleges. I mean Ivy League colleges, you know. So presumably they're pretty high in G. All you have to do is look at them and listen to them. And then you have to ask, is this what G predicts? Uh what we need to put more emphasis on is not whether you can do well on abstract tests that are contextualized in a way that's very different from real world problems. It's what do people do with it? And what we end up with is many of the kinds of leaders we have who are smart but narcissistic and they use their G to get ahead for themselves. And then they'll say friggin' anything uh, to get reelected for the power, the money, and the glory. And I mean, if you look at one of the political parties, they fall all over themselves, contradicting themselves to be subservient uh, to their great leader. And one day they say one thing, and the next day they say something, and they don't friggin' care. Uh, so you know, they're adaptive, but in a way that makes the world a worse place. And that's that's not what the world needs right now. We don't need people who use their intelligence to get a bigger house or to make more money or to uh, get elected to Congress. We need people who will actually do something to make the country or the world better. And we don't have so many of those. It, by coincidence, uh, I'm working right now with a graduate student in Athens, Greece, on a paper on the difference between men's and women's leadership styles. And what I actually suggested it to her this morning, today, is that if you look at why it is that women on average tend to be better leaders, I mean, you know, like if you compare the uh, prime ministers of Finland and New Zealand, and I think Estonia as a woman, there, to some of the uh, men who are in power now, the men tend to get ahead by practical intelligence, which is how, what can I do to maximize my own gains? And the women tend to get ahead by wisdom. What can I do to make the world a better place? So who do you think is going to be a better leader? It's not all women. I mean, there are some who adapt who adopt the more um, practical intelligence, narcissistic, uh, what's in it for me. We have some of those in Congress, uh, you know, the ones who they lose and then they question the election because that's what someone else did. You know, that seems to be the going thing these days. But in, in general, we need more of this female style of wise leadership rather than narcissistic what's in it for me leadership and i'll say whatever it takes to get the votes which many of our politicians seem to do right i mean just anecdotally in higher institutions of power uh, a question of ethics is just completely either missing it or after that when people talk about intelligence ethics seems like this is this bizarre off thing why talk about this mm -hmm. Yeah, it, and ethics is part of wisdom. Yes. Uh, I define wisdom as seeking a common good by balancing your own, others, and larger interests over the long as well as the short term through the infusion of positive ethical values. And yeah, we don't have too many politicians who uh, seem to put much of an emphasis on ethics or e or wisdom. I mean, you know, like in China, one day they have these extreme COVID restrictions. The next day they're gone. I mean, like, you know, was there any rationale for that? I, so there, yeah, it's to uh, quell protests. But so you go from the frying pan to the fire. Or we have another uh, country leader who has started a war because of his narcissistic need to create a new history for his imperialistic history for his country. Uh, so 
thousands and thousands of people die and the world economy is thrown off and just for one guy. And, you know, I used to wonder how did the Germans allow Hitler to come into power and to stay into power? But it's happening now. It's happening right now. It's happening in Russia right now. May not be exactly the same, but it's one narcissistic leader and people just try not to pay too much attention. So it's a problem. And it's not just Russia. It's all over the world. Uh, people put their heads down and uh, cross their fingers. And meanwhile, people die. Yeah, I mean, it's happening here. Yeah, so do we? So are we going to measure their IQ? What's that going to tell us exactly? It's not about their IQ. It's about how you deploy your intelligence. And what the world needs to do is get rid of some of these high IQ leaders who um, just use their intelligence to satisfy their own pathologies. And I mean that, I mean pathologies literally. I don't mean it figuratively. These are people who need psychiatrists, not positions of power. Does, By the way, if I end up getting uh, poisoned or fall from a high building, uh, I remember it started here. <laughs> no, I, I hope I'm only kidding. I hope, I hope. Well, we won't, we won't know who to blame. Yeah, that's, yeah, maybe not. I don't know. Okay, so what does focusing on the other other end of it now? What does a a vision for for institution maybe let's just talk about education look like that actually fosters wisdom? Number one is you start teaching kids about real problems, not fake problems that have four multiple choices with one correct answer and the others are wrong and that are trivial and that are solved individually rather than in groups and that nobody could even care. They're very well structured and all the information you need is in the problem. They're emotionally uninvolving. They're unrealistic. You know, those problems don't educate kids to be real world problems. Ever. So we need problems that are real. We need kids to think in groups about how, how do you solve those problems. It's not that they're going to come up with, you know, miracle answers, but they need to learn how to solve the problems the world really faces. And what do you do when you get emotional about something and you realize it's clouding your judgment? It's sort of like as basic as don't send the email when you feel your blood boiling. You know, we sort of, some of us learn that. Um, so use real world problems, uh, have them think about how do you how do you figure out what might be a common good, realizing that in the short term, some people may not benefit. Uh, you hope that you can find ways to help them benefit in the long term. Um, and we need to emphasize the importance of ethical solutions. Um, the solution to your feelings that, you know, I want to instore, restore the imperialist empire of Russia or whatever country it is, is not to kill a lot of people and destroy the world economy to meet your own uh, pathological needs. I mean, these are kind of basic things. We also need to teach people, it's not only about leadership, it's about followership, that, you know, find ways to keep those people from getting in power in the first place. The problem is, I mean, in countries, you know, where the elections are rigged, like Russia or China, it's too late. You need to, you need to be at this before that happens, because once those people in, are in power, uh, they manipulate the system to stay in power, which they have to, because if they lose power, uh, they don't do well, as we just saw in Peru. Uh, so they're basically into self-preservation mode. But so don't follow people who are malignant, narcissistic leaders. Don't vote for them. Don't support them. The trouble is that people who are charismatic, when people are down, when they feel like, you know, I deserve better, I'm being victimized, uh, malignant, narcissistic leaders always, always play to that. They always create external. The, the playbook has been the same since ancient times, and it still works. Um, don't let them get in power in the first place. But people who feel victimized uh, are susceptible to the cajoling 
treatment of the malignant narcissist. At the level of teaching, do we just need to have a more diverse set of approaches that deal with uh, like the three components of wisdom that you mentioned, um, adapting to an environment, uh, reshaping an environment, selecting a new environment, need to... Yeah, well, think about it. In science, uh, you can use problems like pandemics, uh, pollution, uh, uh, global warming. Uh, in social studies, you can use problems of how how you resolve conflicts between nations or municipalities, mm -hmm. or why people are attracted to toxic leaders, or what do you do when a country becomes polarized? What kinds of steps can you take to mitigate polarization? Uh, in uh, writing and reading, you can have people uh, read whether it's novels or factual accounts of conflicts that arise in people's lives and how they approach them. I think it's it's teaching it's teaching for wise thinking. You, you know, the dictatorships teach kids what to think. And in the United States, we now have a big movement of uh, extremists who are into book banning, which is essentially the same thing. Uh, I mean, the extreme left and the extreme right, as you know, are about the same. It's like you think my way or you're a bad person or, you're, you know, there's something wrong with you. And that that diminishes wisdom. It's people who are foolish uh, trying to make sure that their kids are the same way. They, they're close. They're dogmatic. Uh, and it's working. I mean, you know, these uh, dogmatic people. Uh, often are very passionate because they know they're right. God told them they're right. Uh, and they actually believe that. I mean, it's hard, you know, it's hard for, if, for you and me to believe that they feel divinely inspired. Uh, in, in, and often it ends up that they, they're hateful and they teach kids to be the same way. It's everywhere. It's not just in the United States. It's everywhere. Look at Germany. You know, uh, my wife and kids are dual citizens. I'm an honorary professor in Germany. You know, we think of Germany as one of the more sensible countries. And then we read that there's this far right movement trying to take over the country. And it's, you know, it's not clear how far they might have gotten. So if it if it can happen there where it's already happened not so long ago, it can happen anywhere. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, it happened here two years ago. It's happened here. I mean, we, and it's not over. There, you know, I think that there's an, at least an even shot that this country becomes autocratic. Uh, certainly, that's what Trump wants. And uh, there are others in his party who want the same thing. And there's some in the extreme left uh, who create a different kind of autocracy uh, of you know, whether you want to call it political correctness or wokeness, or it, it's it's characteristic of extremes that they become dogmatic, whether it's right or left or something else, and um, try to impose their way of thinking on everyone else. It, and it's, it's also not the matter of just one election cycle or one decision. It the The factors are at play. And they won't go away. No, they're not going away. They're certainly not away here. I think that we have a real danger uh, in two years that uh, we'll go down. The chances of our going down an autocratic path, I think, are actually quite high because the, the pro-autocratic people are very passionate uh, about establishing you know, uh, our society is being taken away from us. This is really our society. And who are these other people? Uh, you know, this feeling of victimhood and uh, we're being robbed of our, you know, whether it's white Christian nation or somewhere else, it's something else. And um, when you have one group that's really passionate and another group that's kind of, well, that on the one hand, there's this, and on the other hand, there's that, and there's this other point of view, who do you think usually wins? It, it seems like such a daunting task for teachers and educators to try to address this problem. What's your experience been like trying to develop better teaching styles, better testing? Oh, man. I've spent my whole career on it. It's really 
or my uh, undergraduate advisor warned me it's really hard to change the world, and he's right. Uh, the signal mistake this country has made is it's become a slave to uh, testing. It's not the testing itself, it's the kinds of tests and what they measure. And, oh, God, you know, Obama, I think, was generally a good president, but he had such a bad secretary of education. The guy, uh, this is my opinion, uh, he was just, you know, you can test your way into yeah. solving any problem. Uh, it, you know, people who are formulaic, who, you know, here's the solution. Give a lot of tests. Give some more tests. Uh, give tests for the race to the top. Give tests for something else. You know, we don't need people like that. We need people who think. And we don't have so many. Um, and I, so I think Obama in that one really blew it. Uh, and so when we had a chance under a more liberal president to say, hey, look, there's more than just doing well on tests, uh, we didn't get it. And we haven't gotten it since then. I'm not saying tests, I don't think tests are bad. I mean, you know, I'm not at the extreme where I'm, I'm not anti-test. I just think the test should measure knowledge and skills that are important for kids to have, not, um, you know, just sort of mindless exercises and uh, triviality. That's all. But I, I'm not anti-test. And I think we need to know what kids' academic skills are. The problem is that being very academically smart in the end doesn't do much for you. If I, you know, I'm, you know, I, I learned Spanish by using it. I'm trying to learn German now by using it. Uh, you don't learn by memorizing the dictionary or a book of grammar. You don't learn math by memorizing how to solve this kind of problem, or that kind of problem. And so we're too much teaching you know, here's how you solve this problem. Here's how you solve that problem. Here's how you solve that problem. You never know what the problem is in the world. You don't know what the next problem is going to be and what's going to change. And if what we're teaching is how to solve fixed kinds of problems, that's not going to help when you get messy, unstructured, emotionally demanding real world problems. It just doesn't help very much. In fact, it's in a way bad because the people think there ought to be a you know, a solution. And what they do is they go to testing. You know, uh, they don't want to think about it too much. They want to do something. And so they start using a lot of tests, which aren't very good. And we end up where we are today. Yeah. I mean, we all know people who are just absolute geniuses in solving really well-defined problems. But as soon as they have to deal with problem formulation, they just fall apart. Yeah. What they're good at is getting into men's and other high IQ organizations and kind of ends there. I mean, you know, the, the high IQ organizations are actually kind of interesting because you have to ask if someone, it's sort of like when I was a kid, I used to watch Superman on TV with George Reeves and Superman spent all his, he had these superpowers, but he spent all his time saving Jimmy Olsen or Lois Lane. And I remember even as a young kid thinking if he has superpowers, why is he spending all his time just saving Lois Lane and Jimmy Olsen? And so we end up with people who, if they really have these super high IQs, maybe there's something better to do with your time than just spend it on a high IQ society. How about doing something to help the world solve its problems but, in addition to whatever else you want to do? But where does change begin? Because like at the perspective of individual educators, it just seems like there's so much institutional pressure to to conform. Yeah, conformity is... A big problem. Uh, you know, it's unfortunately, I, you know, if I knew how to get these changes to occur, uh, A, I'd be on my own island in the Bahamas, and B, you would have seen things. I better not say the Bahamas. That didn't work so well for uh, Sam Bankman Freed. But, yeah. you know, the, the point is that I don't know how to make this happen. I've been trying and I sometimes feel like I've failed, which I have, but I, you know, despite my having failed so far, I keep trying, realizing that I probably won't succeed and hoping that maybe my kids will or my students will or your students will or something because uh, it's really hard to get changed. People tend to be 
somewhat sheep-like. I mean, like these internet mobs, uh, they're, you know, a lot of the people who, who join the mobs are high IQ, just as in Germany, people who join mobs were of an IQ. They don't think too much. They just go with whatever the latest cause is and, you know, the sense of outrage and emotion. And if that's what we're doing, where do we even start? I don't yeah. know. Yeah. For sure. I mean, there's some really high IQ people that have really dangerous beliefs. Yeah, it's not a prerequisite for not being susceptible to that. No, and IQ and wisdom are totally different. And my argument has been that having an IQ that's very high can actually gravitate against wisdom. Uh, and the reason is that people who are smart think that wisdom automatically comes with it. So when they act foolishly, they don't see it in themselves because they think they're uh, invulnerable to foolishness. But we see a lot of foolishness in high IQ people. And I'm not accepting myself either. I mean, we, it's something we all have to fight in ourselves, including me. One thing that's really tricky to think about conceptually is that you have these foolish systems that are self-perpetuating. You you have a vision of what intelligence looks like. It's bad, and then people constantly feed into it. But how do you trigger that kind of a cycle on the wisdom side? How do you trigger a kind of cycle where it, it builds up? I think the way you try to change it is through schools and parenting. Um, for example, I'll tell you something that happened in our family that, you know, we encourage the kids to wear a mask. I, I'm not revealing any identities here, but there was a lot of social pressure not to wear a mask. And virtually all the kids in the school were not wearing masks. Our kids were wearing masks. And, you know, it's the same with adults. I mean, you know, because every well, it's all over. So one kid takes off the mask and three kids have the flu very soon thereafter influenza and you know the the social pressure is to conform uh it's like you know right now we have going around influenza covid rsv strep throat various other kinds of respiratory things. There's more need for a mask now than there was early in the COVID days, but people aren't wearing them. So what do you do? Some people are. It's not that they're a you know, total solution to anything. And maybe people need to build up their immune system, but if you're over 65, it's, uh, it's a real issue. And as you Despite my youthful appearance, I'm over 65. So I'm trying I don't to stay. It. I don't believe it. Okay, okay. Shifting gears a bit to maybe a more hopeful topic. Uh, can you tell us about your theory of love? Yeah, the theory of love the is called the duplex theory, and it has two parts. One part is what I call a triangular theory of love, and that is that love has three components, intimacy, passion, and commitment. And different combinations of these yield different kinds of love. So intimacy by itself. Intimacy is caring, connection, compassion, communication, a sense of bondedness, of being a unit. It's a good friendship. Passion, everyone knows what that is. It's when you really need to be with a person. You think about them all the time and you can't live without them. Commitment is a cognitive part. It's that you decide you want to stay with the person regardless. And different combinations of those um, yield different kinds of love. So intimacy plus passion is romantic love. Intimacy plus commitment is companion love. Uh, commitment plus passion is fatuous or foolish love. Uh, all three of them is consummate or complete love, but different kinds of love. And uh, my wife actually works, Karen works on this with me. She has a website, lovemultiverse.com, to help people apply this in their lives. So this is stuff you can immediately apply in your own relationships. And then the second part is what I call love is a story. And that is that 
people from the almost time they're born start forming stories of what they think love should be. So an example of a story would be a fairy tale where there's a prince and a princess, very romantic. At the opposite end is a business story, which is very unromantic and love is like a business. Another story is a travel story where two people are traveling together through life. And um, people do better in relationships to the extent that their triangles and their stories match. So it isn't that they're right and wrong triangles or stories it's that you need to be with someone whose story and triangle match yours so the actual positioning doesn't matter it's just it matters some but if both people don't want commitment that's fine but if one person wants commitment and the other doesn't right. that doesn't work so if one person wants passion and the, you know what's the right level of passion who knows but if one person wants it and the other doesn't, that's a problem. If one person wants to communicate a lot and be close and the other is constantly distancing, it doesn't work. So the total amount of love in terms of the triangle matters. But what's more important is that you're looking for the same things. Okay. And and how about your theory of hate? The theory of hate uh, is that the there there's a triangle in stories of hate as well, but the, they're somewhat different. The triangle is negation of intimacy. So one component of hate is negation of, is negation of intimacy, which means you can't imagine being at all close to this kind of person. That, you know, you think of them as they're not quite human. They're, it's like almost where the Republicans and Democrats are today. <laughs> it's, it's this negation of intimacy. Like, what is wrong with these people? I mean, like, are they human? I mean, do, you know, are they from some other planet? Are they robots or, uh, you know, some kind of other animal or something? Uh, that's negation of intimacy. And you see that what cynical leaders do is they inspire negation of intimacy. Uh, that's what uh, Putin did with Ukraine and the Russians. I mean, there's no difference between Ukrainians and Russians. All of a sudden, the Ukrainians are these big enemies. That's what they do. Uh, or all of a sudden, the Jews are enemies, or the Muslims are enemies, or the Buddhists, or the whoever it is. It's uh, it's always the same story with um, narcissistic leaders. It's the other guy who is depriving you. And then the second component is passion. It's where you really get excited about it. They're after your wives. They're after your kids. They're after your property. They're after your money. Uh, they're going to take away everything you have. Um, so what the malignant narcissist does as a leader is rile you up. Uh, so if you look at the uh, proper, you know, the McCarthy era propaganda in the United States, uh, it's to get you excited about, you know, their reds in, in behind every desk and in every corner and in Hollywood and in Washington. And it's the same in many parts of the world today. <laughs> and then commitment is you teach the kids to hate. You, you teach them a cognitive structure. For, let me explain why this religious group really is inferior. Or let me explain why people from that country don't belong here. And schools often play that role, as do media of teaching you a fake history or a fake ethnography of other people that makes it look like your group is superior to that group. They're, they're, this country has had a lot of that. I mean, let's face it. Um, we have, The United States has a very bad history of the way it's treated uh, African-American people, uh, Jewish people, Muslim people, Chinese people, Japanese people. I mean, we have a very bad history. Uh, women didn't vote until, you know, relatively recently. So so it's, it's getting a cognitive structure where you, you just see, yeah, of course they don't. They don't. That's because they're inferior. I mean, that's what the so-called founding fathers believed that, you know, uh, slaves were worth three fifths of a person. So that's the commitment part. That's the cognitive where you actually come to believe all this crap. And that's what that's what the propaganda chat. I mean, that's what right wing and left wing propaganda does in the U.S. Or what, you know, people like Putin suppress all the other media. So all that you hear is this 
these cognitive structures to support the idea that, you know, the Russians are doing this glorious thing for the world uh, and Ukraine is really overrun by CI agents or whatever it is, uh, Westerners. It, but it, it happens everywhere. It happens in the United States. It's, it's, you know, between the South and the North, they often have painted each other as utterly vile. So it's not just in other countries. It happens right here in the United States. Not only in the past, it's happening right now. Yeah, I mean, Roe v. Wade being overturned. Yeah, it just doesn't go away. Yeah. Yeah, well... It's a bleak place to to end off. Um, do you have any any positive ideas to to sound off on, if you like, or or not? Yeah, it. I think it's slightly bleak, but you can't solve a problem if you don't know you have it. And so, if we recognize what we're doing, then we realize that we need to build bridges. Uh, that uh, unless we seek to understand other points of view, why people feel that way, and how we can build a bridge between us and them. Uh, if we don't do that, then I think we're doomed. But I don't think it's necessarily too late. Um, you know, I have tried to do that to some extent. And many people, you know, there are Israeli and Palestinian groups that try to build bridges uh, it's just hard when many people are becoming more and more polarized and then they start following each other. But I, we can't give up. We have to, you know, each of us has to be part of a solution and not part of making the problem worse. And uh, if the one way to guarantee we won't solve these problems is to give up on them. So you keep trying. I mean, I've been trying since uh, before you were born and you just keep going. And that's what I'm doing, and I hope you do too.